I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Christina Costa and I'm a Reiki teacher and practitioner based in Brentwood in Essex. Um, I'm here with Paul Connolly. So Paul, you are a best-selling author um, and your life story is the basis for the upcoming feature film Big Boys Don't Cry, um, which is a harrowing new film about your um, childhood really suffering abuse in a children's home. Um, and then your later co collaboration with the police to bring the abusers to justice. So I've just read Not Normal, which is your third and what you call your most detailed book. Um, yep. And I have to admit, um, I found it deeply shocking. Um, but overall, I've been left with a sense of deep admiration for you and for how you, just how much you've turned your life around. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to ask you about your life in the present day. You know, the, the film really focuses on your past, but I'd like to talk, you to talk about your life now. Um, and kind of the focus of your work and, and how it's changed for you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, where do I start? Some, somebody asked you about your life. You don't know where to start. Yet. <laughs> Most people start with work. So work, I run my own sports injury clinic now and um, a lot of stuff I do can be explained uh, with regards to getting people out of pain and helping people. A lot of it can't be explained. You know, uh, you, know you can explain a lot through science and then there's, then there's all the other stuff. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I've got waiting lists for people to come and see me across the board from babies right up to a um, 88 year old lady I'm with at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I've got waiting lists and um, it's very rewarding the stuff I do. Some of it, like I said, is easy to explain through obviously science and sports science injuries and the spot and you know the work I do, but there's other, there's other stuff that is just freaky and I can't explain it. So that's what. Yeah, I've got two boys mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, got a lovely home and, you know, a wife and everything. So, yeah, everything's, uh, you know, <laughs> everything's lovely. Yeah, so it, I, it, I often use this analogy when people ask me in my life now. You ever watch the movie Oliver Twist when he's living in the slums and he's with Fagin and all that? And then at the end of the movie, he wakes up in these whitewashed streets and they're all singing up. And he's in like, it's heaven. And look out where I live now. It's sort of like that. It's a massive transformation from where I come from. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's lovely. <laughs> Can't complain. Nobody listens to you even if you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks so much. Um, I think you're being quite humble about your <laughs> about your current work. And I know that I think it might be nice for you to just talk about an example. Um, I know you talked about you're working with an Olympic athlete. Is that right? I've worked with quite a few Olympic athletes, yeah, and quite a few celebrities, and people love it when you drop names. Um, <laughs> some I can mention, some I'm not allowed to mention because you have to sign a, a privacy disclosure. But I worked in LA for two years with quite a lot of big Hollywood stars. Um, I've, I can mention some and some I can't. Uh, but they're just people, like all of us, they're no different. They're probably a bit more screwed up than most of us. Um, but you know, I've got like a young lad at the moment with a rare form of dwarfism, which Great Ormond Street couldn't get him out of pain, and I've got him out of pain, and I'm rebuilding his body in the gym. And his mum calls me her angel. I've got an 84 year old woman who I've just got out of pain after hip replacement. Uh, I've got oh my god, stories all day long that I can tell you because I, I do about 12 clients a day, and it's it's quite grueling. I go from 10 to 10. But, you know, I love what I do, so I sort of thrive on it. And it's, you have to balance it a bit, of course. Um, but it all turned around about 10 years ago, to be fair, when I got very ill myself from overworking. I was doing like a 90-hour week. Oh, I, I was making the movie. I was giving evidence in the government historical child abuse case. I was writing this book with Shannon Kai, Not Normal, uh, who she's Jay Goody's deathbed ghostwriter. She's a very hard-bitten journalist. And then I was doing 60 hours a week in my clinic. So I literally became very ill and was rushed to hospital with this, this disease. They call it the silent killer. It kills about 300 people a year. It's called endocarditis. It's an infection that you can get from a dentist. But the dentist will deny that, of course. But you're predisposed to it if you have any heart issues. So at, uh, at 49... I found that I had a, heat, a leaky heart valve that I was born with. And this is after having 84 amateur fights and, you know, being a first personal trainee in the city back in 86 and running the London Marathon. And then apparently I've got something wrong with my heart. So um, 
But what happened was when they took me into hospital after weeks of being ill, they said that to the wife and the kids to come up and say goodbye. They said, I won't be there in the morning because if you're 60 percent or more infected with this disease, you have organ failure and death. So they said I would be dead by the morning, but I've been nearly dead lots of times and I keep disappointing them. <laughs> so uh, what happened was halfway through the night in Basildon Hospital, I was on a heart ward there. A big black man appeared at the side of my bed. Now the one who's not spiritual will go, oh, my God, what a woman. Right, but this he's as real as you were, okay? And I wasn't particularly spiritual back then, to be fair. I was I was dabbled. I dabbled, but I wasn't, you know, you know me. I, when you ask me loads of questions, I, 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 I wasn't a particularly spiritual person. And he was this huge black man. And he said to me, do you mind if I hold your hand and, and say some comforting words to you. And those exact words were, this was 10 years ago, do you mind if I hold your hand and say some comforting words to you? And all I remember was this big, handsome black man outside of my bed. So I like said, yeah, and he held my hand and he started saying these words and I was really comforted. I was really comforted. I felt like all the fear and all the pain and everything that was, was going, it just disappeared. And it was just like, wow, you know, this is lovely. So I was quite happy, you know. I've gone from being sort of really in pain and really... Anyway, in the morning I was there and they was all around the bed going, he's not supposed to be here, he's alive. And I was on, the, on a drip in that hospital for five weeks fighting the infection and one, obviously. And at that time I went down to the, into the uh, church to thank this big black priest. I asked everyone who he was and where he was and nobody had ever heard of him. He didn't exist. But ever since then, my whole work life transformed. I went from being this hard-bitten boxing coach and this... Uh, PT and this boot camp guy who just used to kick his clients up the arse and swear at them if they didn't work hard enough to somebody who's just getting everyone who comes anywhere near them out of pain and it's re remarkable and somebody told me it's called a walk-in and I don't know what it was mm. to be honest with you it's, it's, I've never even heard of a walk-in I didn't know what it was but my life has transformed since then in a massive way and years ago when i was a gangster running around with a gun down the back of my trousers a couple of little i was on a tube train this is interesting in bethnal green and i was with two big black guys and we were going off up to no good and uh, i was this violent aggressive young man gangster on the door very angry and this little irish fellow said to me on the train so you're the chosen one are you and they started laughing at him he said oh you're the chosen one and then he's like most people wouldn't even talk to us they'd avoid us if they saw us and I was like, they, all my mates were laughing and we were like big, huge men, you know, nasty men, horrible men, people you would avoid. And he decided to come straight up to me and said, mark my words, one day you're going to be a great healer. He said, not now. He said, you're a violent, aggressive man. He said, it's a lot of my accent. He said, mark my words, you're going to be a great healer. And I was like, yeah, go away. Anyway, they were all laughing and I was sort of laughing because he said to me, you're the, and in Ireland, they're called the seventh son of the seventh son, the chosen one. And I am the seventh son of the seventh one seventh son of the seventh son so i sort of was laughing but i also sort of knew what he meant mm. and here we are at 58 and what he predicted to come true in a funny way you know it's like you know it's just it's remarkable how things turn out you know absolutely so i mean i think it's really good to reflect on your past and try and pinpoint moments of transformation and that's what you just said you use the word transformation um mm. so it sounds like 10 years ago was when your spiritual journey perhaps began mm. and i've had some um, i've had some other things happen to me since then which i couldn't explain you know so mm. and if, if you tell people they just go oh don't be daft you know but yeah sorry so no it's all it's all fascinating um and so obviously i'm my profession is reiki i'm really interested in reiki was it um was it around that time that reiki came into your life yeah i've done the reiki one and i did the reiki two and and i and I, first i read a book about self-healing and then everything i was reading pointed me to reiki for self-healing and then I, I sort of had this little handbook which was showing me all the hand movements and what to do and i used to go to bed and try and do stuff on myself and then I went and did the Reiki one and then I've done the Reiki two and I, and I want to do the masters, but I just haven't really got around to it. And then, but I, I'm one of these people that I don't, I just don't stick with one thing. I like to look at everything and oh. take stuff from everywhere, but I just kept getting drawn to the Reiki because there's something else called the Mar Marconi or something that everyone keeps talking about. 
and you know, I, I just, I just think it's either in you or it's not. And if you know, there's lots of people who heal with Reiki, but lots of people heal without it, don't they? But I found Reiki's really worked for me. Um, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I, I believe that everyone can learn to heal. It's not a special gift. It is possible to learn Reiki. But you're quite right that there are some people who, um, who naturally are born healers. Um, yeah. And in fact, there are lots of different healing modalities. I think there are something like 80 different mm. um, energy healing modalities. So Reiki is not the only method, um, but it is for me one that's very, um, it's fairly simple and it's structured and it's effective, which is why I think it, that's why it um, was something that I was drawn to as well. Because I I didn't even know what a chakra was before I learned Reiki. I was not in that world either. No. So I can empathise. Um, so, well, go on, sorry. No, you go. You go. Um, yeah. So in your book, you do mention Reiki. And I was really happy there was like a few lines at the end of your book, Not Normal. Um, and I have a question because in your book, you describe that when you first heard about Reiki and you heard about the story of the founder, Mikao Usui, um, in your own words, you said it sounded unlikely to say the least. Um, and then in the book, it says that you chatted to some people who'd done it and you decided to sign up for a level one course. So I'm just very curious. Um, what was it that they said to you that changed your mind? I spoke, to, what I did was I went to a few people for Reiki treatment on myself and then I started seeing colours and things like that. And I went, well, this is interesting. Why am I seeing these colours? And then I couldn't explain the colours. And then I started having like... I just became more conscious and more self-aware and then it just drew me more to it. And it was just, I think it was the fact that I was being treated, or if you call it treatment, I was having Reiki done to me and it drew me to think that, like, like, you know, there must be something in this because I was seeing these like, like, you know, like these lava lamps that go all crazy. I was seeing all of that and I was like, what is this? This is, I've never seen this before. And it, I don't like not being able to explain anything. You know, I like to find out what's going on. So it just drew me further and further and further into it, you know. So, so that's interesting. So it sounds like for you, you needed to experience Reiki before you could fully commit to to yeah. learning it. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I like evidence, and you know, this is probably why I, I don't. I, you know, everyone starts off skeptical, don't they? And and I think you just need to, you know, it's, it's all our own journey and. I've always been very good with the emotional intelligence, so I just thought there's definitely more to us than just, you know, just the brain and the body and the bones. We we are far more powerful than that, obviously. I mean, it, even science can prove that, you know. So, yeah, it's interesting. But what another thing was I kept having these experiences. I had my blinds behind you lit up one night, like Tinkerbell, and they all went, like, the whole room lit up, and then it went dark. And then I had, um, I've had quite a few experiences that I couldn't explain. I've had, like, you know, and when you tell people, they go, well, you were asleep, you were dreaming, you know, things like that. When I went to, when I go to Ireland, they, they mob me in these little villages where my family come from and they do an earthworm trick. I don't know if you know about the seventh son and the seventh son. And they, they, if you put the earthworm in your hand, the true seventh son and the seventh son, the earthworm dies and it does, it stops moving. So it's just a party trick in the pub. And the earthworm stops moving with me, and they all go crazy. And then they ask me to close my eyes and think of initials, and whatever initials I give them, they go and bet on those horses that day, and they invariably win. So there's all crazy stuff that we don't understand. You know, I don't understand half of it. But in Ireland, they all want to touch me because the t the, the true seventh son of the seventh son is lucky and charmed, and is supposed to be able to heal. That's the myth. So mm. as soon as the earthworm dies in your hand, then everyone's buying drinks in the pub. <laughs> So there's all this stuff that you sort of think is your destiny, but at the same time, like you say, anybody can heal. You just have to tune into it. Anybody, you know, I, I, you know, when I work on trigger points, when I'm doing my actual job, if I if I actually concentrate and try and put some like some loving energy into those into those energy into those trigger points, people's pain drops so much quicker than if I'm just doing it without thinking about it. You know, so mm. it's it's remarkable. Like the results are remarkable with Reiki. So, do you think then? Because it sounds like you have a bit of a combination. You have the Reiki training that you received, and you have obviously you're obviously a very spiritual person, and you've had spiritual mm. experiences in your life. Um, 
can you kind of pinpoint the difference maybe I think your work is a good example to use um can you pinpoint the difference before you learned Reiki and after um so a really good example is a girl that came to me very recently she was on um I won't say her name she's obviously she was she was very she was she's had a very troubled past herself and I get a lot of people like that drawn to me because of my past and she was like, I'm on 13 different types of meds. I'm on a heavy duty antidepressants. And the hospital told me I'm going to be in a wheelchair by the time, within a year. Well, she's, she, I mean, she wrote me a lovely review on Google. She's, she's off all the drugs. She's, she's perfect, her back's perfectly strong and fit now. And she predominantly had Reiki from me. Not a lot of, not a lot of sports injury stuff. It was always, and the Reiki almost, because a lot of her problems were in her head as well as physiological she had a lot of psychological problems and i'm a qualified life coach right so i could say to her right i'll give you hypnotherapy i'll do nlp i'll do all these things that i've learned on you to help you with your psychology psychological problems but they wouldn't work because for her to regress take her back horrible into horrible places the reiki just seemed to allow her to release all that emotional turmoil without the regression without the, the damaging regression that hypnotherapy and, and psychotherapy and NLP does to people. And it was remarkable. Her results were remarkable. She's off all her meds. She's off her antidepressants. She, she's, she's not, her back is strong. I built her back in the gym. And she initially came to me and I was treating her through sports massage and trigger point, And it was having some of a result. And then one day she said, oh, I'd really like to try the Reiki. And, oh, my God, it, the results were remarkable. Psychologically, physiologically, everything changed for her. And it literally changed the round within one or two treatments. And then, you know, it's just – and I found that as, as, as much as she had physiological problems, she also had a lot of psychological ones. And the Reiki just basically allowed her to release a lot of that emotional baggage without doing all the damaging regression that, that I think hypnotherapy can do. It can take people back where they don't want to go. And she's like a different person. And she wrote this um, review, and it was basically she said it can't be explained, and, you know, I, you know I'll, I'll, I'll forever be in debt. And that was Reiki. That was not, that wasn't, you know, it was, it was remarkable. And yet for other people, it, you know, it's, I use other methods. I, I just, you just tune into people, don't you? And you just, and you just know what to do, you know, don't have to think about it yeah absolutely Paul um I thank you so much for sharing that story and I I totally agree I think everybody is individual so Mm. it's it's difficult to say in fact impossible to say do this this will definitely help you I think Mm. whereas Reiki might work for one person hypnotherapy might be working for someone else I do know some wonderful hypnotherapists so I don't think it's all it's all bad I think it's as you say, tuning into the person and finding what works for them. No, um, I just think for her, not everyone, but for her personally, that wouldn't have worked because mm. she had so much, she was already at such a low ebb and the Reiki just, I mean, I could actually see her becoming far, her energy lifting and, and her could actually feel, like see that her glowing and I, so many things happen. And I, when I do Reiki now in my studio, I've got shutters that go up and it's got Reiki on, and and the shutters go up, and the and the, and the incense sticks, and all the music comes on, and the whole atmosphere in the room changes. It's, it's changes because it's a gym or it's a sports injury clinic, and it changes into something instantly. The minute I do these certain things in the room, I've got mm. shutters that black the room out. The salt lamp goes on. I do everything, that, and then, and that mindset, then the the right sounds go on, and the right smells come, and the lemongrass comes out and the whole thing changes it changes into a totally different situation and mm. this woman just really really like i've never seen such remarkable results with somebody in such a short period of time wow. i think that's what's great about reiki though is that it's you a person doesn't have to say anything that's what's nice if they don't want to speak if they don't want to share what's going on with them yeah. as a practitioner you don't you don't have to ask some questions you don't need to know and, and, and yeah. then sometimes you also know without them saying it you know i know what's wrong with her i you know i i, I know i can i had i had people that come in and they don't tell me what their problems are but i just know without them telling me i know what the problem is 
and and sometimes I've told them they go, "How do you know that was the problem? Oh, it was your father. He was an alcoholic." Like, how did you know? <laughs> I don't know how I knew. I just knew, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is. But a really good story is my dog. My dog's my wife's a cynic. She doesn't. She's very cynical about. That. And twice my dog's become ill, and twice I've healed him with Reiki, and she's now like, oh, "I'm never going to say anything bad about Reiki ever again," because she adores this dog, right? One Saturday night, I came in from work, and the dog was shaking under the table, trembling under the table, and he was unwell. And she phoned the vet, and the vet said, "Yeah, come out. Like it's 120 quid before you even turn up, right?" So he was under the table. So I crawled under the table with him, and he sort of my hands went to his stomach, and he was shaking, and he was. You can just see he was unwell. And when I was when I was like working on his stomach and creating all this heat and all this energy around his stomach. He closed his paws around my hands and pulled my hand into his stomach mm. and he fell asleep. And then he was really quite emotional, you know. And then when he fell asleep, I, I worked on him for about 20 minutes. And when he fell asleep, I put him in his bed and I said, just leave him. Hopefully he'll be all right in the morning. Well, he come flying out of the bed and he had this mad half hour like a puppy again. <laughs> and, and he was fine, instantly fine. And twice that's happened. And then she... And she always used to go, oh, waking nonsense. And now she's like, she never, she's never said that since. She's like, no, there's, there's, no, I'm, I, I'd never say that again. Because she's, obs- she's obsessed with the dog. Trust me, I'd go before the dog does. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think animal Reiki is a really fantastic um, practice because humans, in a way, they can be, you know, I don't want to say boring, but they lie down. So nothing really happens. But when you're working with an animal, you have to keep your eyes open. You have to watch the um, body language of the animal. And whereas a human would have thoughts, um, animals tend, they don't. They sense things. You know, a dog thinks, well, hey, it's, it's morning. Yeah, I'm going to go for a walk. Yeah, I've got food. So The dog's instinctive. I mean, you know, I've never had a human take grasp my hands and pull my hands where they need to go. Mm. My, you know the dog did the dog did the dog pulled my hands down to his stomach they were going there anyway but he guided me with his own paws yeah it's crazy right because dogs are instinctive that and i think healing's instinctive and and it's it's you don't you don't think about it do you don't have to think about it that's what makes it so easy it's, it's, it's not taxing at all perhaps it's easy for you i think quite a few people struggle with their mind <laughs> Yeah. Is this working? Is this not working? Uh, what is his energy? What's going on? And they can actually find their mind being blown a little bit. So I think, I think from what we've, what conversations we've had, you're very intuitive. So I think be grateful for that. <laughs> I think people are only intuitive if they accept it. Mm. Don't question it. I don't see the reason to question anything that works. If it works, it works. Don't, I don't need to know why. I don't need to know how. I don't need to question it. I only question things that don't work to find out why they don't work. But if they work, I don't need to ask why they work. And uh, and I think that people that struggle with it is because they're too busy questioning it. Why don't you just accept that that it works? (laughs) I completely agree. Wow. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful place to kind of conclude. Um, I just wanted to ask you very quickly, so just briefly, um, I know you do a lot of charity work and the charity Kids Inspire is on the back cover of your book, Not Normal. Um, yeah. Would you just like to explain a little bit about that? And Yeah, there's a lady called Sue Bell who who is one of the founders of that and she's a very spiritual lady. She, she does all sorts. She's, her All of her, her, their work starts from a spiritual premise with the kids and she's one of the founders and they're always trying to raise money. They deal with the worst abused kids in Essex. And they do amazing work and they're always, you know, needing money. They sort of get government money, but not much because they have to work with, with kids for the government as well. And they are remarkable what they do. Um, I work with a few charities, but this charity, this is a proper charity. They, you know, I've worked with big charities in London where I've raised 200 grand and I found out the CEO earns 200 grand a year. Well, this charity, most of them work six days a week and get paid for four. So they're, they're proper. It's a proper charity. And some of the stories are heartbreaking, you know, with the children and they're just, but what I liked about them is not just that their intentions are wonderful, uh, it's the fact that the the founders are, she, she does all sorts of spiritual stuff with kids. That's, and, and, and although they're doing lots of like counselling, it comes from a spiritual like base. They do Reiki, they do all sorts, they have all different uh, people coming in and working with the children. 
So it's amazing. And also work with a charity called If Only, who work with adults that were abused as children. And that's uh, Stacey Solomon's stepmom, Karen, and they set that up recently. I've just helped them set that up and get charitable status. So I'm working with real charities as opposed to posh ones. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's, keep it, let's keep it friendly <laughs> <laughs> absolutely thank you so much Paul it's been really great chatting to you about life and raking <laughs> we finally got it done <laughs> we did